Jesus plainly God. Jesus plainly God. How many of y'all believe he's plainly God? No debate about it. John chapter 16, verse 16. You have that? Praise God. John 16, 16. What an awesome move, God, we had Sunday night. Amen. A wonderful word preached. It was, it was God, and what can you say? It was just wonderful to hear the word that we heard, to feel the presence of God that we felt, and people experiencing God, the level that they experienced Him. It was just wonderful. I treasure that kind of move of the Spirit of the Lord. John 16, verse 16, Jesus speaking. He says, a little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and you shall not see me? And again a little while and you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing. Read that with me. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. They had asked nothing in his name up to that point. Not one thing. They didn't petition. They didn't pray in his name. They didn't ask anything in his name. The whole time before this. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Verse 27. For the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. And have believed that I came out from God. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Father we just thank you tonight for your awesome word and your awesome spirit. We glorify you, we honor you tonight, Jesus. We stand in reverential awe and respect, God, to you. We glorify you. We thank you tonight, God, for what you've done for us. The salvation you have provided for us. We don't take lightly, Lord, your presence. What we'll hear tonight, your word. We don't take it lightly, Lord. We are thankful tonight for it, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Be glorified, God, in this message. You may be seated. Before we get into the teaching tonight, I want to share with you something. I went on the internet today, and Isaac Newton, commonly called Sir Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton intrigues me. He really does. He's sort of like Einstein. Einstein intrigues me. You know... These men, mathematicians, physicists, etc., were men that were not just on a quest to determine science. They were on a quest to locate God. They were on a quest to find eternal life. They were on a quest 
to find the key of life. And as they did those things in their journey to find God and eternal life and the origin of life, they came across certain scientific discoveries. But that wasn't their ultimate goal. My little girl has got an autobiography uh, by, on Isaac Newton's life, and it is fascinating. It states that right there in that, in that book, and it's not a religious book. It is a secular autobiography that you can get in a library. And it states it right in there. It tells you that he wasn't just a mathematician and a physicist. He was a mystic. He sought for hidden truth behind the natural order of things. Brilliant man. Let me just real quickly read something to you. Sir Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727. Mathematician and physicist. One of the foremost scientific intellects of all time. I want you to hear what he had to say. He actually wrote a book on on God, the nature of God. His religious convictions and personality, it says here in this article that Newton also wrote on uh, Judeo-Christian prophecy. And I told you before, I I believe he wrote a book on Daniel. I wasn't sure if he had one on Revelation, but he's got one on each. He wasn't just a mathematician, he wasn't just a physicist, and wasn't one of the, only the brightest minds to have ever exist, but this man was a man who loved God, who wrote books on prophecy and on God, wrote a book on Daniel, wrote a book on the book of Revelation, and you can go on the internet and get excerpts of, of those books, and even get those books today. But a particular book that he wrote on Judeo-Christian Christian prophecy, it says here in this article whose decipherment was essential, he thought, to the understanding of God. Did you get that? To the understanding of God. The disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying. They didn't understand the purpose, the plan. You with me up to this point? So Newton wrote this book way back in the middle 1600s, up into the 1700s was his life. On understanding of God. His book on the subject was, which was reprinted, reprinted well into the Victorian age, represented a lifelong study. Its message was that Christianity went astray in the 4th century A.D. When the first council of Nicaea propounded erroneous doctrine of the nature of Christ. The full extent of Newton's unorthodoxy was recognized. They said it was unorthodox, and it probably, to a certain extent, I don't know if it was or not, but that's what they say. The full extent of Newton's unorthodoxy was recognized only in the present century. But although a critic of the accepted Trinitarian dogmas and the Council of Nicaea, he possessed a deep religious sense, venerated the Bible, and accepted its account of of creation. In late editions of his scientific works, he expressed a strong sense of God's providential role in nature. That is coming from a genius. A mathematician, a physicist, but more than that, a a man who loved God and wrote prophetic books. And one book that he wrote says that the Christian world went astray in the 4th century when they uh, sought to present God in a Trinitarian Three-person type arrangement. Hallelujah. Now in his autobiography, they call him a Unitarian. But that's what Trinitarians call oneness believers. He was not a, he was not a Unitarian. He was a oneness believer. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. And his work dealt with the understanding of God. We are dealing with the oneness of God. And that Jesus is God. We apostolics know that message. We apostolics, it has been given to us to declare that to the world. Jesus, when he walked this earth, he spoke in a a proverb. At times, and again, when you read the Bible, it sounds like that he's making references to different persons. 
But he's not. It's all a proverb. Amen. It's hidden from those. This knowledge that you are hearing about the godness of Jesus. This knowledge was hidden. Are you with me? It was hidden to people who are just curious. It's hidden today to people who are just curious. It only comes to you by divine revelation. I, can, I will stand up here tonight as the weeks before this night and I will declare you truths about Jesus' godness. But if you don't have a revelation of the Spirit, you won't understand a thing I'm saying. Because with the Word, when it goes forth, the only way you can understand it is if it's revealed to you by the Father. Amen? So it is a, it's spiritually discerned, the revelation that Jesus Christ is Almighty God. That He's not a God. He is Almighty God. He is not the second person of anything. All the fullness of the Godhead. All the fullness of the Godhead. Play Roma, fullness, Godhead, Theos. All the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ bodily. He's not in the Godhead. All the Godhead is in Him. Deity is in Him. But when He walked this earth as a man and as God... As a man specifically, as a servant, as a man, he would give glory to his father. And it sounded like that the father was separate from him when he would talk about the father. He said the father did the works. He didn't take credit for it. He didn't say, I do the works. When the miracles were done, he didn't say, I did that miracle. Are you catching this? He's the father, but he didn't take any credit for it. He didn't say, I do the works. He didn't say the words I'm telling you are coming from me. He made statements like this. He said, it's the father that doeth the work. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they're not my own. They are the father's. So he didn't ever take any credit for himself, but he always glorified what seemed like another person. You with me? Glorified an invisible spirit. And when he talked, you, you really, you couldn't understand totally. Now listen, he did tell his disciples, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But what we're trying to show you is that he spoke to them in figurative language. He spoke to them in veiled language. Even though he told them, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father. They still did not recognize that because his full deity was veiled to a certain extent. It was still hidden to them. Even when he said, when you've seen me, you have seen the Father, it still was not a total recognition of his deity. They didn't have a total understanding. It was still figurative. It was still dark to them. It was still a veiled truth to them. Come on, somebody. And it was supposed to be. Did you hear what I said? It was supposed to be veiled. It was supposed to be figurative. It was supposed to be proverbial. Uh, uh, proverbial. Okay, you with me here? Go to Matthew 13. Y'all with me now? Hallelujah. But he said there's coming a time when he's going to show you the Father plainly. It's no longer going to be veiled. It's no longer going to be hidden. It's no longer going to be without understanding. You're going to recognize it plainly. You're going to recognize plainly the godness of Jesus. It's going to take me an hour to pump you up. Okay, let's go to Matthew 13. Let's look at something Jesus said. You know, he spoke in parables often. We just don't realize that when it comes to his nature... That he presented himself in parables. Or in proverbs or figurative language or veiled speech. But he did. He had to. Because he had a role to fulfill in this world before Calvary. 
And that role before Calvary was to give glory to the Father. To take no credit for himself. But to give glory to an invisible spirit that you could not see. That was his role as the son. As the son, he had a specific role to perform. And that was not to take credit for the miracles. To take credit for the word that he preached. What, but to glorify the Father that was inside of him. Hallelujah. So they had a hard time understanding who is this Jesus. Even his disciples had a hard time understanding who is this Jesus. And Jerusalem especially had a hard time understanding who is this Jesus. Why did they have a hard time understanding it? Well, it was God walking among them in human form, but it was veiled. Hallelujah. They did not understand their own prophecies. They didn't understand the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Jesus. They understood that Messiah would be king, but they did not understand that Messiah would go to Calvary. They didn't understand that. It was a mystery to them. Are you here right now? Jesus comes along. He speaks to them in parables. Matthew 13. Say amen. amen. Let me get this. I wasn't planning on going on into this, but uh, let me do it here. All right, let's look at Matthew 13. Jesus speaking in parables. He asked, the disciples asked him, verse 10. The disciples came and said unto him. Are y'all with me when your Bible's there? Matthew 13. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why all this figurative language? Why these proverbs, these parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. Why wasn't it given to the people to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven? Look up here at me, please. It says this. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, he shall have more abundance but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Why aren't they hearing? Why aren't they understanding? Okay, listen. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. Say with me, shall not understand. Not understand. And seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Why is that? Why are they not going to be able to see? Why are they not going to be able to perceive? Why are they not going to be able to understand what he is teaching? Here. For this people's heart is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes. And hear with their ears. And should understand with their heart. And should be converted. And I should heal them. He said the reason why I'm speaking to parables. Is because it's not just to the curious person. The reason why they're not hearing and understanding and seeing. Is because they have closed their heart. They close their ears. They shut up their heart. So that they cannot hear and they cannot see and they cannot perceive. Watch. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Why? Because you're not just a curious listener. You're not just a curious observer. 
you are somebody that will give yourself to the truth. You'll give your heart to the truth, your mind to the truth, your eyes to the truth, your ears to the truth. You'll give yourself to God. You understand? For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? Verse 34, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled, verse 35, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Are you hearing me today? So that was Jesus' method of, uh, of ministry. Was to go forth and, and present himself in parable form. To preach in parable form. Veiled to the people. Come on. And so that even his disciples did not understand. Totally. Amen. They got glimpses of his deity from time to time. But they still didn't have a total unveiled recognition of the deity of Jesus Christ. <laughs> mm. Woo, hallelujah. Are you hearing me today? And I'll tell you tonight, you and I have had glimpses of his deity, but we still don't have an, un an unveiled recognition of his deity yet. So in these messages, God is trying to open our eyes and our ears and our understanding so that we can see Jesus plainly God. He wants to take the stuff, the scales off our eyes. Get rid of the heaviness of our heart, the grossness of our heart. So we can hear spiritual truth. You can't hear spiritual truth through fleshly heart. Heavy flesh doesn't hear God. Woo. But I want to know him plainly. Say amen. John 16. Let's go back over there and look at what Jesus is saying to those disciples. John 16. He tells them in verse 16. He, he says, a little while you shall see me in. Again, a little while and you shall, you shall not see me. And again, a little while you shall see me because I go to the Father. All right. What's he talking about there? Well, this is about Calvary. When he is slain on the cross, that's what he's talking about. A little while and you won't see me. But after Calvary, you're going to see me again. So you've got Jesus speaking here before Calvary. Okay? Then he says at the time of Calvary, he will be hidden to them. But then after Calvary, he will be seen of them again. Now watch. But there's something that's going to change at Calvary. Something is going to be different from the days of Calvary and beyond. You with me here? The days are going to be different from when he walked the earth. It's not going to be proverb. It's not going to be veiled language. It's not going to be figurative. When you get on the other side of Calvary, it's going to be Jesus plainly God. Say amen. So... Pre-Calvary, Calvary, and then after Calvary. All right, here we go. The disciples in verse 17 and 18, they don't understand. They don't understand what he's telling them. A little while you won't see me, and then a, a little while you'll see me again. It's all uh, just a, a figurative speech to them. It's veiled. It's, it's a parable. It's a proverb to them. Do you get the point? They don't understand it. Are you here? Yeah. The Bible goes on and says, Jesus knew what was in their heart, knew that they wanted to ask him that, the question concerning that statement. So he explains to them in verse 20. Verse 20. Oh, you got your Bibles open. Hallelujah. Read along with me. And I know only, only really hungry people do that. <laughs> I know curious people don't even bring their Bible to church. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Now, the context of that immediate statement is this. He's fixing to go to the cross. And they're going to be full of sorrow when he goes to the cross. Do you understand? Now, the scripture tells us. He says, verse 21, a woman when she is in travail has sorrow. Because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow. But I will see you again. You're going to have sorrow when I go to the cross. But you're going to see me again. Now, this is so powerful. You're going to see me again. That's what he told him. Amen? Amen. Hmm. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Wow. When you get beyond the time of your sorrow, beyond Calvary... There's going to be something that is totally different. You are not going to ask me anything up to that point. They have been depending on him for everything. Do you get the point? They're depending on him for everything. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Watch this. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, He will give it you. In my name. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Up to that point, they have not used His name. They haven't asked anything in the the name of Jesus. But after Calvary, something's going to change. Then they're going to ask the Father in His name. What He's saying is this. You are going to understand plainly that I'm the Father. So that when you pray in the name of Jesus, you are praying to me as the Father. And I'm no longer going to be pointing to an invisible spirit and giving credit to an invisible spirit for the miracles and for the words that are spoken. You're going to know plainly that I am the Father. You're going to pray in my name. You haven't asked anything up to this point in my name. You haven't prayed in my name. You haven't. Come on, somebody. But after Calvary, something's going to happen with the name. The name of Jesus could not remit sin before Calvary. Because the blood had not been shed. But after Calvary, after the blood was shed, after the the disciples go through the time of sorrow, now the blood is shed. When you call the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, the blood is in the name. But before that, there could be no remission of sins by the name of Jesus because the blood hadn't been shed yet. But you go to Calvary, Jesus is going to go to Calvary, shed that blood. And there's going to be power and authority in that name. You're going to pray in the name. You're going to talk to me, the Father, in the name of Jesus. You're going to preach in my name. You're going to baptize in my name after Calvary. Something's going to happen after Calvary. It's not going to be Proverbs anymore. I'm not going to give credit to an invisible spirit. That's what he had to do as long as he was in the earth before Calvary. Come on. John 17, 4. He says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. 
He's saying this. This is before Calvary. He said, up to this point, I have glorified you, Father. But he talks about a time when he will be glorified. The time of his glorification is his death, his burial, his resurrection. When he comes out in a glorified body. Come on, are you here today? The Bible tells us in 16th chapter. He said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh. When I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. He said, there's coming a time you're going to recognize my Godness plainly. There won't be, come on somebody. This, there won't be a, a veil. There won't be like, a, like I have been up to this point, giving glory to an invisible spirit. And it sounds like uh, there's somebody else beside me. He said, there's coming a time you're going to pray in my name. You're going to recognize me as God plainly. You're going to see I am the Father plainly. Up to this point, they don't understand totally His Godness. But after Calvary, when He comes out of the grave, having been crucified, He comes out of the grave, resurrected from the dead. He, then they see Him face to face. Then they get a revelation. Of this plan. Woo. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. They don't understand everything. They don't understand that he's plainly God. Or plainly the father. They don't understand the purpose of Calvary. It's not enough to preach Calvary. You need to understand the purpose of Calvary. Give God some praise. The purpose of Calvary and the reason why he's speaking them in Proverbs up to that point is because he has to. Come on, come on. But after Calvary, then you're going to preach his name. You're going to preach in his name. You're going to declare that Jesus is plainly God. It's not going to be a proverb. It's not going to be veiled flesh. Veiled anymore. It's going to be a clear understanding of the godness of Jesus. Because he's not going to say, I give glory to the Father. He doeth the works. He's not going to be talking like that anymore. He's not going to be giving glory to an invisible spirit. He's going to say, I am the Father. I am the invisible spirit. I am God. Say amen. amen. Number one, the reason for Calvary is to show his godness plainly. That once he gets beyond Calvary, it's going to be plain. He is God. No more veiled speech. No more figurative speech. Plainly, Jesus is the Father. Plainly, Jesus is God. Hallelujah. It's as plain as it can possibly be. Number two, you're going to know the purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection. Not just that he said he was going to die and be buried and rise again, but you're going to know the purpose of that. Say the purpose of that. And the purpose is that his name might be preached so that they would bring re remission of sins to people. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. His godness, you're going to know the purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection. Number three, the remission of sins is going to be in his name. But before Calvary, there could not be any remission of sins. Because the blood had to be shed. Come on, somebody. Number four. The reason for Calvary is that His Spirit can come inside of us. The Holy Ghost is going to come inside of us. If He doesn't die, then He cannot come inside of us. His Spirit cannot indwell us if He doesn't die. Do you understand? 
So up to this point, they don't have a total clear recognition of his godness. They don't understand why he's going to die, be buried, and rise again on the third day. Are you here today? Give God praise. But he's, he's showing them through these chapters why he has to go to Calvary. So they can see his godness. So his name can be preached. So he, you can pray in his name. So you can recognize his godness. So that there would be remission of sins in his name. And so that you could receive the Holy Ghost. Because as long as he's here in the physical, you cannot receive his spirit. Because the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Jesus. That's why he's got to die. Say amen. amen. Give God some praise. <clears throat> Woo, hallelujah. Do you, are, you show, are you getting what I'm trying to show you here? Let me just give you another verse of scripture. I think you maybe need this. Luke 24, this is be, hallelujah, hallelujah. This is after Calvary. Luke 24, watch this. Verse 44, say after Calvary. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Do you understand that? It was all prophesied, but they didn't have an understanding of their own prophecies. You with me? Amen. Then open he, then, when is then? Then is after Calvary. What is he going to do? He's going to show them plainly the Father. He's going to show them the reason for Calvary. Come on. Then open he their understanding. After Calvary, now he's opening their understanding. It's no longer proverb. It's no longer figurative. It is no longer veiled. Now he is going to open their understanding about the very prophecies that spoke of him. Then opened he, then after Calvary, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and saith unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Why? That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Amen. Among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father. What is the promise of the Father? It's the Holy Ghost. He gives them the reason why he's going to go and die on that cross. He's opening their understanding now. Say amen. amen. So that now the name of Jesus can be preached for repentance and remission of sins. And so that the Holy Ghost can come and live inside of you. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tear you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Wait till you get clothed with your clothing. Wait till you get be endued with power. To be endued means to be clothed upon with the Spirit of God. So he's telling them the purpose. Now, though, it's after Calvary, and now it's understanding time. Now it... Do you understand tonight? Or are you yet in the dark? Do you understand that before Calvary, he had to give glory to the Father as if he was giving glory to somebody beside himself. He had to say, it's not my works, it's the Father's. He had to say, it's not my word, but the Father. He had to talk like that. But now, after Calvary, he is the Father plainly. He's seen as the Father plainly. Give God some praise. Now you're going to preach the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And now you're going to be endued with power from on high. You're going to get Jesus in another form. He's going to come to you in the Holy Ghost. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. But he can't come as the Holy Ghost to you, God in activity, until he dies on Calvary. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give God praise. 
Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tear you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He led them out as far as Beth. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. Came to pass while he blessed them. He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. There's his ascension. And they worshipped him. Hallelujah. Woo. Did you catch it? Now they, they worship him. God is the only one to receive worship. If you worship Jesus, he's either God or you're in sin. Because you can only worship what you declare to be God. They worshipped him as God. So now they understand after Calvary, the purpose for Calvary is that remission, repentance and remission of sins would be preached in that name of Jesus. And that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And now they worship him plainly as God. It's plain to them now. Now they've had their understanding opened up. Now they've been enlightened. Up to this point though, he, they're just saying, what does all this mean? What does it mean that we won't see you and then we'll see you again? What does this all mean? You talk like this, Jesus. We don't understand what you're talking about. But now, after Calvary, they see it face to face. Say amen. Give God some praise. Go to Matthew 28. After Calvary. <coughs> After Calvary, he says this, watch. Now, the context, woo, yeah. yeah. God is an awesome God. <clears throat> Let's start at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went into, away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Are you here right now? He told them before he went to Calvary where he would meet them after Calvary. Watch this. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all authority, all exousia. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That word is not the same word. That's dynamite power. That's dynamic power. It's a quality it is a quality of his spirit. Dunamis. Dunamis. You shall receive dunamis. You shall receive dynamic power when the spirit of God comes on you. But that's not the word he uses here when he says all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. It is exousia which means all authority. He said I got all authority in both realms. I've got authority in the earth realm. And I've got authority in the heavenly realm. I've got authority in the invisible realm. And I've got authority in the visible realm. Invisible and visible. Heaven and earth. I've got authority in both realms. Come on. He said all authority now. See, he's not talking like he used to. See, before he said, hey, the Father, he, I don't do it. It's not me. It's the Father. He doeth the word. It's not, it's not my words. It's the Father that speaketh. Come on. He's always giving glory to an invisible spirit because he has to before Calvary. But after Calvary, all authority. He's talking different now. Hallelujah. He's got all authority in both realms now. Heaven and earth. Invisible and visible. Say amen. Which means he don't have one third power. You get the point? He don't have one third power because he is the Father. He is the Son. He is the Holy Ghost. One God, three roles. One God, three manifestations. One God, three modes. Each of them fulfilling the designated purpose. Come on, somebody. So he says, all authority. Hallelujah. Now only God has all authority. Yeah. Say amen. amen. Praise God. I pray you're getting this. Woo, power in both realms. Now watch this. He said all power is given unto me. Look at that. He's not giving glory to an invisible spirit now. He says all power, all exousia, all authority is given to me. See, there's something that has happened after Calvary. There's something that's different about the name. There's something different about the revelation.
revelation of Jesus. They plainly recognize he's the Father. Now they understand they're going to preach the name for the remission of sin. Now they understand they're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Now they understand that all authority is given to him. He's got all authority in both realms. Woo, give God praise. He's an awesome God. <laughs> and because he has all authority in both realms. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name. Name. Not names. Name. He said, what's over you asking my Name. You understand I'm the Father. You're going to ask in my name. Now he tells them here, he says, Go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What's his name? Jesus. <clears throat> Say Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> he is Lord, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Say Amen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name. Literally, it's into the name. You're going to baptize him, baptize people into the name of Jesus. It's name singular because he's talking about one name in particular. It's the name of Jesus that brings remission. It's the name of the Father. It's the name of the Son. It's the name of the Holy Ghost. And the name is Jesus. It's one particular name that we're baptized into. So when I baptize you in Jesus' name, or whoever baptized you in Jesus' name, we could literally say it this way. I now baptize you into the name of Jesus. I put you into his name right now. And when we did that, hallelujah, it's because you recognize that Jesus is God. That he's not a second or a third person. That Jesus is the Father. Jesus is God. Remission of sins only comes in his name. Hallelujah. You get the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus in another form. Say amen. amen. Power, authority in both realms. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Give God praise. Amen. Say amen. amen. Go to John 7. I know I'm talking fast, but I think you can hear fast. John chapter 7. Watch what Jesus says. Verse 34, you shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go? Look at this. Nobody understands what he's talking about. This is before Calvary. Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go into his shop, uh, be dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, you shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither you cannot come. In that day, that great day of the feast. Are you all with me? Verse 37. Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What is he talking about? But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus hadn't been to the cross yet. He hadn't been buried. He hadn't been raised. He hadn't, he hadn't yet ascended. So the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. But after Calvary, the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out. If you believe as the scripture has said, your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is my key of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified give God praise something is different now go to Philippians chapter 2 <clears throat> are y'all getting it do you understand Woo, hallelujah now the disciples are going to see Jesus plainly for who he is 
No need for veiled speech as a servant. No need to talk in parables. Now you can see God plainly. You can understand what Calvary produces. The name of Jesus is going to bring remission of sins. You're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 2. Watch this. Paul said it this way. Philippians. Is everybody still there? (laughs) Philippians 2. Hallelujah. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Be filled with the mind of deity. Be filled with the mind of divinity. Be filled with the mind of humility. Who being in the form of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Come on somebody. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. So as he walks, he is God. He never ceased to be God. Never did Jesus ever cease to be God. Or cease to be the Father. But it seemed to be he gave glory to an invisible. He did. Because he's walking in the form of a servant. He's talking as a servant. You with me? Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) Yeah, man, I can't believe it's almost been an hour. Can you? But made himself of no reputation, no reputation, no reputation. It's the Father, he doeth the work. It's the words of the Father, not mine. He's speaking as a servant. He's speaking as man. Though he never ceased to be God. But they didn't understand it. It was all a parable. It was all veiled. They didn't recognize his full deity. And being found in the fashion of a man as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Ah, there's Calvary. Wherefore? Because he went to Calvary. God also hath highly exalted him. And give it him a name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth. Power or dominion, authority in both realms. Heaven and earth. Visible and invisible. Never cease to be God. But veiled God came to us. God in veiled form. Came to us God in parable form. Oh yeah, God in proverb form. Not totally recognizing his deity. Even though he said, when you've seen me, the Father. You've seen the Father. They still did not recognize it plainly. Hallelujah. Give God praise. But now, he's got a name. At the name of Jesus, every, uh, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth. Sound just like Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And things under the earth. (laughs) And that, oh yeah, he's got dominion. (laughs) And that every tongue should confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the master. Jesus Christ is the ruler. In both realms, heaven and earth. To what? To the glory of God the Father. Give the Lord some praise. Acts chapter 2. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Say after Calvary. In Acts chapter 2. This is real famous for Pentecostals. And apostolics. Jesus plainly God. Acts chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 22. Y'all there yet? Okay, you ready? We got to go fast. Acts 2. That's that's 22. Here here we go. Watch this. You men of Israel. This is after Calvary. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. This is the first message preached by an apostolic. 
This is the first message preached by an apostle. This whole message is about the Godhead of Jesus. This whole message is about the Godness of Jesus. This whole message is showing you Jesus plainly God. Jesus plainly the Father. Jesus in three rows. Oh, not just three, but Jesus in four rows. First message preached by an apostle. First apostolic message. And the whole thing is about the Godhead of Jesus or the Godness of Jesus. And this is after Calvary. So you don't miss it now. The disciples are going forth and preaching the name which is above every name. They are preaching the name that brings remission of sins. Hallelujah. They're preaching Jesus is plainly God. Watch this, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. God set it up. God set the whole thing up. God, listen to me. God knew that he would someday take upon himself the form of a man. You hear me? It is foreknowledge. He set it up. He said, okay, in his foreknowledge, one day, I, God, am going to come into the world in the form of a man. And God in human form, Jesus, I will go to the cross and I will die for the sins of people. God set it all up. He knew he would come in the form of a man. He knew that he would come as a man and die on the cross. Are you getting the point? Watch. You have taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain. How did that happen? By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew what he would do. He knew he'd come in as a man. He knew he would die on the cross as a man. Come on, yeah. God wouldn't die, but God would come in the form of a man. Now, he would have to come in the form of a man. Come on. It's all a parable. It's all a mystery. People don't understand it. They didn't understand it then. But God is trying to show you the Godhead of Jesus here. He's trying to show you. It was all in his mind before the foundation of the world that he, as God, would come in the form of a man and die. Because a spirit can't die. You can't kill God. You can't kill an eternal spirit. I can't kill your spirit. I can't kill your spirit. I can't kill your spirit. And you can't kill my spirit. How how do you think you could kill the spirit of God? No. God said the spirit of God. He knew he would take on himself the form of a man. He set it all up. And he would die as a man. Come on. God in that man. Say amen. Amen. (laughs) Jesus never ceased to be God. Even when he died on the cross, he never ceased to be God. God in flesh. Watch. It's all about the Godhead of Jesus. It's plainly being preached now. Watch this. The Bible said he was crucified whom God raised up. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding holding of it. Hallelujah. Death, burial, resurrection, Calvary, and beyond Calvary. Amen. God set it up. Watch this. Verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Listen. I foresaw the Lord. Say Lord. Lord. That's Adonai. I foresaw the Lord. I foresaw the ruler. (laughs) Yeah, come on. Are you here? I saw Adonai, I saw the master, I saw the ruler, hallelujah. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. (laughs) Yeah, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now listen. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore being a prophet. 
and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the what? Flesh. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Say amen. amen. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up. Therefore we are we all are witnesses. Hallelujah. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. What you have there is Jesus in his fullness. You have Jesus as Father. You have Jesus as Holy Ghost. You have Jesus as the Son who died. Give God praise. Jesus. Jesus as the Son. God in the Son. The Son died. Come on, somebody. Then you have, come on, amen. Give God some praise. You have reference to... uh, The Father. Amen. The promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is the Holy Ghost. This is just different roles or modes of the same one God named Jesus. You getting the point? You getting the point? Are you really? He's giving you a message about the Godhead of Jesus. He's giving you a message about the Godness of Jesus. He's showing you plainly who Jesus is. He is the Father. He is the Holy Ghost. And He is the Son that died. Not three separate persons. But God in His fullness. Operating three modes. Three ways. Now listen. Listen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and have received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Come on. It's his spirit. It's the Holy Ghost. the spirit of God. For David is not ascended in the heavens, but he saith, to, he saith himself. Here we go. The Lord said unto my Lord. God. All right, brother. Thank you. God said unto Adonai. The Spirit said to the humanity. (laughs) Not one God speaking to another God. Not one person speaking to another person. But the Spirit, Yod Hey Vav Hey God, speaking to humanity, Lord Adonai. God, Spirit speaking to humanity. Deity speaking to humanity. Not one God talking to another God. Not one person talking to another person. But Spirit speaking to humanity. Say amen. Amen. We just have different roles of God. Say amen. Amen. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. Hallelujah. I'm feeling real good right now. Amen. For David is not ascended into heavens, but he saith to himself, The Lord, that's God, all capitalized, said unto my Lord, one capital L, and all small letters after that, Adonai. So you've got yod Vav Hey or Yahweh, said to Adonai. You don't have two gods talking here. Come on. You've got the Spirit speaking to the humanity here. Watch. Say Amen. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. I will God. God is showing you what he's going to do through humanity. God through humanity is going to defeat his enemies. Did you catch that? So we have, listen, we have a conversation. God speaking to humanity. We have God declaring what he would do in that humanity when he came. He would rule Adonai. Come on. Are you with me? He would defeat his enemies through that humanity. Not two persons or two gods. But God in different roles. God, come on, spirit working through humanity. Flesh. Listen. Hallelujah. 
But he saith himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit down on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Adonai Christos. Adonai Christ. He has authority in both realms. He's got authority in heaven and in earth. It's after Calvary now. That's what he's saying. Say amen. amen. Go to Psalm 110. I'm going to close. Show you what he's, show, what he's saying here. No, I got I to gotta, I gotta read a little more. Oh, see, I'm trying to rush myself here. Ha. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assured that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Come on, here we go. He's preaching the godness of Jesus plainly. And then he tells them what they need to do. Hallelujah. He said, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the purpose of Calvary. It's all there. It's what we've been trying to get you to see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now you can get the Holy Ghost. Now you can receive remission of sins. Now you can understand that Jesus is plainly God. Psalm 110. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I promise. Woo. Ooh, man, I'm having a good time. Now, this is the Psalm of David that the Apostle Peter is preaching from. Declaring the godness of Jesus plainly. The Godhead of Jesus plainly. Now, don't look at me like you don't understand what I've said. Everything I said is so easy and so basic. If I can understand it, if I can even put it in my language, you should have no problem understanding what I'm saying. If I can get it down to my level, I know you can grasp it. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. What you simply have here is this, is that Jesus spoke like he did before Calvary because he had to operate in a specific role, servant and son, giving glory to the Father. But after Calvary, now he's got all power and authority in both realms, heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. Now you can see that Jesus is plainly God. Now you can understand why he had to die for the remission of sins. And now you understand why he had to die so you can get the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. But he is plainly God. Now you get the Holy Ghost. That's God in activity inside of you. Same God, Spirit of Jesus. Same God, not a different God or a second person. The same Spirit that was in Jesus. Christ's Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Why is it called Holy Ghost? Because it's God in activity. In co Listen, when you cooperate in your spirit with God's spirit, then God can act through you. Hallelujah. That's why it says you've got the Holy Ghost. Because it's God in activity. That's why it's called the book of Acts. Because it's God in activity. It's the Holy Ghost, but it's God himself. It's the spirit of Jesus indwelling believers now. It's just another role, another form. Of Jesus. Whether he be son. Whether he be father. Whether he be son. Whether he be Holy Ghost. It's all Jesus. It's just different roles. And he talks like he does before Calvary. Because he's fulfilling a specific role. And after Calvary plainly the father. Now the Holy Ghost and the Pentecost poured out. To live inside of you. Still Jesus. Hey isn't this beautiful? So that first apostolic message by an ap apostle that was preached was declaring to you plainly, Jesus is God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But not everybody understands it to this day because it's not just to the curious. Psalm 110, I'm closing. This is the prophecy that da David is... Peter's speaking of concerning David, what David said about his Lord, Jesus, plainly God. He said, prophetically, the Lord said unto my Lord, Yahweh, yod hey vav hey, let's just say this, God said to my Lord, Adonai, our master ruler, say amen. 
It's not one God talking to another God. It's not the first person talking to the second person. It is spirit speaking to humanity. Come on, watch. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is what the spirit is going to go through, going to do through the flesh, the Lord or the master. The spirit of God through Jesus, through his humanity, through his work is going to defeat his foes. Say amen. amen. Are you getting it? Amen. The Lord who? The Lord. We're talking about God, right? Yeah. Shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. There's going to come a time when Adonai is going to rule in the midst of his enemies. But who is Adonai? Adonai? None other than God in flesh. And God in flesh, God through the flesh is going to rule over his enemies. Say amen. amen. Which means his enemies are going to submit to his spirit. For they are going to, in the day of his power, in the day of his authority, they are going to submit to him in the day of his power. And they're going to do it willingly. <laughs> thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. There we go. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Watch this. Watch this. This is a prophecy about God. About God, what God would do through the Lord, His humanity. What God would do through His humanity. Hallelujah. Say amen. You got it? He, we have a prophecy. Verse 3, thy people shall be willing the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. That can literally be translated, uh, the dew of thy youth uh, can be translated, thy, the, thy sonship. Yeled. It is, the Hebrew word means that God or the Lord, this is a prophecy, let me just give it to you, without getting too technical. This is a prophecy uh, when the Lord God himself would come in the form of son. Did you hear what I said? Let me read it to you again. From the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. It speaks of sonship. Literally can be translated sonship. Come on, amen. It talks about when God would be born, not God himself, but God in the form of a man. This is a prophecy. God is saying there's coming a day. I'm coming in a man. There's coming a day. I'm going to come in a son. There's coming. A, this is a prophecy about God himself coming in human form. Amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Now watch this. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Say praise to God. Praise the Lord... Adonai, at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Well, I thought it said in verse 2, the Lord all capitalized shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. In verse 5, Adonai, at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. What he's trying to show you is what God is going to do in and through the Son. It's a conversation with the Spirit and the flesh. It's a prophecy about when God would come in the form of the Son. Now listen. What is David saying? The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings of David's wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. What David is trying to get you to understand is that according to the flesh, Jesus in his humanity, in flesh, is God. Amen. That, listen, are you getting this? David is trying to show you here the godness of Jesus plainly. The Godhead. Peter is preaching David. What David said. David said there's coming a day when God is going to rule through Adonai. There's coming a day when the Spirit is going to come in the form of a son. And when he does, hallelujah, the Bible says in the day of his power, the enemies will be willing. Which means they're going to submit to his Spirit. 
He's literally showing you. David is saying, my son is my God. My son, according to the flesh, Adonai, is also my God. He's not just a man. He is God. He's not just a man. He showed hey, Vav, hey, who came as the dew of the morning. Give God praise. Woo, hallelujah. So now we know plainly the Father. Lord all capitalizes his deity. Adonai, capital L O R D, is Adonai. That's his humanity. David is saying, according to the flesh, he's my son. But according to the spirit, he's my God. Peter's got a revelation of it. It's just Jesus came in different forms and different roles and talked like parables before Calvary. But now he's glorified. God in human form, the glorified Son of God. Come on, you having all power and all authority. Living inside of you, Jesus inside of you, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God inside of you. Spirit of Jesus inside of you. Jesus, plainly God. Give the Lord praise. The Lord through humanity. Hallelujah. Well, I think you understand, don't you? I, I got a bunch more, but I got to stop. <laughs> That's good enough. Hallelujah. If you get that, you're doing good. You're doing good. Plainly now, we live in days where it's plain. Plain. That Jesus is the Father, His Son, and Holy Ghost. It's plain. Peter said, you know what? Now I got a revelation since Calvary. He's got power in both realms. As God and as man. You with me? (laughs) Hallelujah. That's why you're going to call him Lord Jesus Christ. Plain. Plain. No mystery. The only mystery, greatest mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The mystery is not, come on. We don't, it's not a mystery that God came in flesh. The mystery is how that happened. <laughs> and every day we look into this and seek more and more understanding. The more we understand the mystery of how it happened. Do you understand? Do you understand Jesus is plainly God? <laughs> okay. You, you look like you do. Hallelujah. Well, let me just tell you this, man. I don't totally understand. I don't. I don't totally understand how, how God could do that. But he did. How God could come in the form of a man and do what he did because he had to. Because as God, eternal spirit can't die. So he had to add himself the nature of human, humanity. And through that humanity, he will judge. Through that humanity, he will die. We have the name which is above every name now. You're baptized in the name of God. <laughs> Jesus, plainly God. Woo, I'm thankful. 